Um, why do you think your own it doesn't exist like that for most people who read it? You said it's a whole way of living, and like and reading Rand sometimes she referred to it like when she was writing it that yep. she was writing business and economic issues in human terms. That was what interested her. She was like, mm. I'm excited that I can, it's, it's while she was writing it, she said, I'm able to do it. She yep. wasn't sure like how to do it. But I think the way most particularly businessmen and, and maybe Silicon Valley people view it is like purely in, in economic and business terms. I agree. I agree. I, I don't know. I mean, I wish I knew. Mm. I know. I'm asking you to extrapolate away your experience, which is hard to do. But yeah, but it, it, to... It, it's a it's a it's a big question. Why do so many people respond differently to Atlas Shrugged? So mm -hmm. they're, they're basically three responses, right? Eh, um, you know, it, it, it didn't do anything for me. I loved it, but I but that's it. Or it changed my life, right? And and I'm pursuing it as a way of living, right? And and why particularly those last two? Why are they different? Why do so many very successful businessmen read Atlas Shrugged and inspires them to be better businessmen and everything, but it never really goes beyond that. It never becomes a governing philosophy of their life. And why do some of us read it and go, this is how I want to live my life. This is a, this is going to be a governing philosophy for me now. And, and I, there's something about the psychology of when you read it. Um, yep. it it's something about when you read where you are in life Right. It's something about the kind of mind you have and how philosophical or how interested it is in questions like that. Uh, it, there's got to be a self-esteem issue there of, of what your self-esteem is when you read the book mm. and, and whether you see it as an attack on you or whether you see it as a as pro. But I really don't know. It'd be interesting because John Allison. What about an emotional issue. repression issue? It could be it could be an issue of emotional repression. That's Sense a good of life. Point. In how fact, emotionally repressed you are and how, you, how much you connect emotionally to it. So I think it's a lot of different things going on when you read the book and why it has the impact on it. But for example, John Allison read Atlas Shrug, and I think the found head, and was inspired and loved it and, and, and really helped him become a better businessman and everything. But he didn't take it seriously as a philosophy until he read Opa many years later, right? And then he got it as a philosophy. But I don't, I don't know that anybody else would have had gone in that sequence, right? So it really is, and if he'd read Opa 20 years earlier, it would have had an impact on him, right? So it's, it's, mm. it's so individual dependent on the state of mind, your psychology, uh, and, and your, your, the degree to which you're intellectually active. And look, it, coming out of business school, what he wanted was to be a businessman. That was his focus. That's all he cared about. And it could be that the philosoph philosophical didn't see the relevance, wasn't important, mm -hmm. good, living good life. And then later, after having this life experience and being challenged by all kinds of things and seeing the philosophical connections, philosophy clicks, right? So it could be the different things click for you in different points in your life. All right, Nick has had his hand up for a while. Yeah, you I, I want- the hand up feature that, that helps. Okay, Richard. Yeah, we'll get to you, Richard, next. Nick. Yeah, I wanted to uh, touch- on uh, self-esteem in relation to self-acceptance uh, and self-assertiveness. Like self-esteem is something we, as you said, is something we experience as opposed to self-acceptance and self-assertiveness is something we do. And the way I understand self-acceptance is not to be in an adverse, in an adversarial relationship uh, uh, with yourself. And self-assertiveness is taking it a step further uh, in terms of advocating uh, uh, more for yourself in terms of in relation to self-esteem. So again, uh, this is the difference between the value and the virtues. So th these, these, are, these are from the six pillars. These are two of the six pillars from Brandon. These are, in a sense, virtues that he's saying lead you to self-esteem. Uh, and I'd say his self-acceptance, I think, is a little wishy-washy. I, I, I would replace self-acceptance with self-knowledge, uh, which I think you need for self-acceptance anyway, but I think the important thing is to know yourself, to know who you are, to know your weaknesses, to know your strengths, to know your abilities, to know what you're good at, what you're not, to know where you've evaded, to know where you've done bad things, to know you've, you've done good things, so that you can now engage in the thinking, the work to get yourself to be better, right? So this is where pride comes in. I wanna be better. Pride is the virtue that tells you 
be better, right? Strive for, you know, uh, uh, more perfection. Keep, keep pushing, keep pushing yourself. But to do that, you have to know, you have to know yourself. How rational am I? How rationally do I behave? Um, do I sometimes go by my emotion? Do I sometimes not uh, you, you pretend my emotions are tools of cognition? Do I sometimes pretend that? And if I do, how do I stop doing that? So again, I view that as self-knowledge and then you have to take the actions that pride guides you to fix them. And that's, you know, a lot of that is under integrity. How do I live by the code of values that I've determined for myself? And, and, and here, the, you know, you have to have the right code of values. So let's assume here the, 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 the right kind of virtues, that the, the objectivist virtues. Self-assertiveness is, I, I mean, again, I think he puts all these at the same level. I'm not sure they are all at the same level. But I take self-assertiveness as act. Um, again, another aspect of integrity. Don't just believe it. Don't just hold it. Do something about it, right? Um, I, in my Iran's Rules for Life, I, I talk about don't be passive. Action, you know, be active, active thinker, an active doer, but an active fixer, uh, an act, active fixer-upper, right? Fix your consciousness, fix your mistakes, fix your, your, your character, fix, fix your soul. Soul, you know, just in case Alex asked, is, is similar to, to uh, what I mean by spiritual, right? Uh, if, if, if fix the way, if, if, you, if you find yourself, eh, I'm not always independent. Sometimes I do what my family thinks I should do. Well, fix it. <laughs> stop it. You know, next time you're tempted to do what your family tells you, stop yourself. That's what self-assertiveness means. But it really is just an aspect of integrity, right? It just means live by the values you proclaim and, and, and the values you claim to hold. All right, Richard. Yeah, um, I'm currently in law school and you talk a lot about how career is the you know probably the primary thing that you do so obviously one of the major sources of your self-esteem and your pride so my question is you know I've worked pretty hard in school um, but I haven't had much opportunity to actually gain work experience and just if you could share a little bit on how young people can sort of in the context of an education that I've personally been told uh, school doesn't really help prepare you for actual practice. So um, I don't know if you can relate to that at all with your PhD, but sure. how, how would you go about um, gaining those sorts of values in the context of an education like that? And well, while you're a student, that's your career. While you're a student, that's your productive activity. And that's how you need to view it. So be a good one. Be a good student. Now, that, again, that doesn't mean you have to be good at everything. It doesn't mean that you should, for example, get you really work hard at subjects you don't really care that much about. But think about it. That is, if you're not good at something, why am I not good at it? How could I become better? Do I want to become better? Is there a rational reason to become better? You know, go through the motions just like you would at the job. What, you know, why am I good at this? Why am I not good at that? Why am I motivated here? Why am I not motivated there? Use it as an opportunity for self-knowledge. Use it as an opportunity for figuring out that you can do it. I can do it when I apply myself. Um, and again, the, the worthiness is as you work to integrate your emotions with your values better, um, then when you succeed, in a sense, pat yourself on the back. That is, recognize that, allow yourself to feel a po the positive emotion that comes from success. You know, again, if you, if you, if you have Debbie's um, upbringing, right, you're taught, don't feel good about your success. You know, don't let yourself feel those positive emotions. Repress them, suppress them, put them aside. And we're so, you know, Christianity is an unbelievably repressive uh, ideology. It's all about repressing emotion. And that's incredibly damaging because then how do you gain that sense of self-worth that self-esteem is about? Because you never feel it. Somebody asked me in the, in the, in the super chat yesterday or the before yesterday, exactly about this. He said, 
what about when I achieve things and nothing happens, right? I don't feel anything. I achieve it. I'm supposed to feel good, but nothing happens. Well, that's not good. <laughs> yeah. I, and you need to you need to you need to fix it, and and that requires maybe it requires a psychologist, maybe it requires a lot of introspection, but it definitely requires getting rid of whatever it is that's repressing that natural positive emotion. Evolution would not. It doesn't make any sense for human beings not to be rewarded spiritually for achieving something. Right? Your your survival depends on achievement. <laughs> Your success as a human being depends on achievement. So we are built in order to, 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 we're built in a way that we get rewarded for it. We get rewards for it. And something's wrong when the reward doesn't come. And, and assuming it's not something biologically wrong, then it's something psychologically wrong and it needs to be fixed. Or if you expect the reward to come from somebody else. Yeah. Or from or something, or else. something yeah. irrational. Like what if the goal was irrational? Yes, yeah, so it goes you back know. to second handedness. If you expect the reward, to, to come from, from outside of you. And, and rewards don't come from outside of you. Self-esteem doesn't come from outside of you. Uh, your self-worth doesn't come from outside of you. Your, your, none of that comes up. It has to come from you. Now, again, when you're a child, some of the, the, the signals come out from outside of you and you learn from how other people respond. And this is why parents can really screw up their children. Right, because if 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 you're slapped around every time you feel joy, then it's going to be hard to feel joy because you're associated yeah. with pain. Right, so it's it's uh, you can it's much easier to screw up your kids than to get them right. <laughs> but you're wrong, don't you think? Practically, the bigger problem today is over praising with children. 